before I read, uh, I had a, a moment of panic today when I was trying to, s to decide what to read for you, for you uh, because I'm the, I'm the kind of guy who, much to the chagrin of the marketers in this commodified mass market America, um, I, I, I am loath to repeat myself. I want some, each piece of writing to be something completely different. And uh, I thought I had, when I was looking through my past works, I was shocked to discover that I had failed at this, that everything I had written seemed to be about our struggle to remain human, our struggle to re in, a, in, a, in, a, in an increasingly different world to remain human. And, um, and then I thought about it some more, and I thought, wait a minute, that's, that's, <laughs> that's at the bottom of every story. That's uh, part of all literature. It's in the basis of all art. It's the stuff of life, and I felt a little better. <laughs> so um, I, I'm, uh, I'm reading from a work in progress. Um, it's a memoir. It's not a novel. The person in this exists, and the events happened as I, uh, as I will read them. It's called The Lady Next Door. The lady who lives in the apartment next door to me swears that when I sit on my couch puffing on an American spirit, the smoke seeps through the walls and endangers her life and limb. She's a stout woman, multi-toned blonde hair, and a face that dares the world to take the least advantage of her. I think she works for the airlines. I often see her bustling out the door dragging one of those black, compact, Suitcase on, suitcase on wheels contraptions in her wake. She lives alone. A few years ago, I made a $1,000 donation to Project Renewal, the homeless services agency that had been instrumental in my conversion from the street life and 12 years of crack addiction. In acknowledgement of this, they sent me a large and nifty doormat, cleverly inscribed with the words, Home at Last. It had magical powers, too, or at least so it seemed. For every time I stepped outside, I found it had moved itself from the foot of my door into the corridor. After a few weeks of watching this happen, it ceased to be amusing, and I decided I'd get to the bottom of what was going on. So I dragged myself out of bed early for a few mornings and stationed myself in the stairwell half a flight up so that I could peer down at the doorway unobserved. Three days into this vigil, I had my answer. It was her, the lady next door. I heard her door close behind her, and I peeked down just as she crossed my point of view and descended the lower landing. Behind her, the doormat had been kicked askew. I wondered for the longest time what would make her do this, whether there was some gripe afoot over something I had done. She was never the friendliest person. I moved into the apartment in 1998, and in all the time I have lived there, the lady next door has not entertained so much as a single visitor that I am aware of. And though I always perk up my voice to greet her with the most cheerful and charming good morning, or afternoon, or evening, or just plain hello that I can muster, my efforts are always rebuked with a resolute, tight-lipped scowl. Just days after I moved in, I heard from the president of the board that a lady next door had filed complaints that I closed my door too loudly. <laughs> in the interest of being a good neighbor, I took pains from there on not to swing my door shut, but to ease it closed until I heard the click of the latch. A few weeks, weeks later, she complained that I sometimes leave my door ajar when I run down to the lobby to fetch my mail. I couldn't for the life of me fathom how such a thing might be of any offense to her. Then, one day, I chanced to notice that her own doormat, one of those thin black rubber slabs, was rolled up into a cylinder and wedged into the gap between the bottom of her door and the floor. Obviously, she must have, for some reason, seen me as malodorous. I thought of my two cats, a violation under the condo board's restrictions against pets, one which 
any number of the tenants don't feel all that compelled to comply. I thought of the cat litter box and all that implied and actually stood outside my door for several minutes at one point, sniffing the air to see if any of its attendant effluvia could be detected out in the hall. It couldn't. It wasn't until I heard once again from the board lady who lived just up the stairs that the lady next door was livid over having a smoker of cigarettes living adjacent to her, poisoning up her air. This despite the fact that grand old building that this is, the walls are so thick, the metal frame, door frame so larded with concrete that I could practically detonate a nuclear device in my apartment in the dead of night without rousing so much as an errant snore from the neighbors. Even so, I invested in a $30 smokeless, smokeless ashtray and a $300 ionizing air purifier in an effort to render myself as non-toxic as possible. Still, the rubber remained wedged under her door, and still she scowled and refused to say boo back to me no matter how sweetly I greeted her. Eventually, I realized that it wasn't my smoke itself anymore. It was me. I had violated the way she thought the world should rightly be, and this, above all else, had placed me beneath her contempt. I could quit smoking outright, and her misanthropy towards me would nonetheless persist. But the business with my new doormat was another matter. There's nothing about it that connects to smoking or polluting or doing anything at all to the lady next door. And that she takes the time and effort each day as she leaves her apartment to kick the thing out into the middle of the hall seems simply malicious. That being so, I see no other course than to confront her. Ask her politely, but not without purpose, why on nurse she engages in such madness. I get the chance one Friday evening at the mailbox. I have shut my door completely before coming down, as has become my habit, and am retrieving my mail when I see her, wheelie suitcase contraption balanced against her hip, struggling with her keys to open the lobby door. I immediately open the door for her and step aside to let her in. The thank you she begrudges for this is barely audible, delivered not to my face, but towards the far fireplace molded into the opposite lobby wall. By the way, I quickly adjunct, um, I've been finding my doormat out in the middle of the floor just about every day. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that, would you? She turns to face me, a dark flame in her eyes. It's too big, she tersely replies. House rules say it can't be any wider than your door. Oh, I say, it's flown off for a second. <laughs> I didn't know that. Read the bylaws, she shoots back. I complained to the board over a month ago, and it's still there. No, no one ever said anything to me, I tell her. My, my, my apologies, but please, we live inches away from each other. We're two human beings. If there's ever anything I do that disturbs you, if I play my TV too loudly or bang around too much, anything at all, just knock on my door and let me know, person to person. This brings a frown to her face. It's their job, she says. That's what we have a board for, to make sure everyone follows the rules. Yeah, but kicking my mat into the hole doesn't solve anything, I tell her. How was I supposed to know you were doing it? If you read the bylaws, she intones, you would know. With that, she pushes past me and down the hall. Conversation is over. When I get back upstairs, I sit there smoking for a while, careful to lean into the smokeless ashtray when I exhale, and stare at the wall between me and the lady next door. I'm frustrated and exasperated. I want to be pissed off at her. I want to rail away at her unreasonableness, to plan some sort of fitting revenge, dig up some infraction she is committing, perhaps, and report her to the board lady. But I can only think of how dark, how sad, how small and mean and empty her lonely little life must be. And knowing just what that's like, myself, after a decade on drugs, I'm practically in tears. 
A few weeks later, I'm returning from the city, the Columbia University Law School and invited me to face a panel of students to discuss and debate social policy. The gist of the evening seemed to be convened around an assumption among the young and earnest collegians in the room that by some feat of will and intellect, we might arrive at a law for each and every social ill that would render us a fair and equitable society. Compelled to disabuse them of this notion, I found myself saying that all social problems boil down to one question. How are we in an increasingly textured world to reasonably exist? How are we to remain human to one another? And the answer to that question I posited is and always has been that we just keep at it. Get up each morning and give it another honest try. It was one of those times when you discover a potent idea just as it comes out of your mouth. I doubt if it was a response that would find the profitable place on any of the Columbia's audience's final law exam, but turning it over and over in my mind on the train ride home, I couldn't shake the basic truth of it. I felt gratified and humbled to have stumbled upon such a kernel of clarity. Then, walking into the lobby of my building, I see the lady next door and her confounded travel all compaction, contraption at the mailbox. The two of them obviously back from a late shift. I can tell right off the day had been even less to her satisfaction than usual. There are deep frown, furrows in her forehead accompanying her trademark weight of the world scowl. I gather up my breath, rub up a smile, look straight at her downturn eyes, and knowing I will not get any response, knowing she might take me for a Pollyanna and a fool, give her my best. Good evening. How are you? Thank you.